Okay. Um, I have some places we can go, but I uh, will open it up to questions and answers. Psalm 32. And Renee Zimmerman. Um, in the psalm, the terms are used transgression and sin and iniquity, and there's also rebellion, and there's a lot of words. I know there are um, some talking... There's just got to be, I would like to know the differences like iniquity sure. and transgression. Sure. And, There's a bunch of, uh, I should really grab, before you leave, I can give you a book that has a chapter that really does a great job of going through all the Hebrew terminology for sin. I'll see what I can remember. It's by George Zemeck, and it's just, the pages you want are like seven or eight pages in a little paperback, but it's fantastic. Um, there's a number of ways of speaking of sin, and, and when I say metaphors, what I mean by metaphors is simply different ways of framing it. So one of the words for sin, I believe it's just simply the word translated sin. Let me get there myself, 32. Um, means missing the mark. It's the same word used um, when Gideon raised his army. And they kept paring it down and paring it down and paring it down. At the last cut, there were a bunch of men who could throw a stone at a hare at so many yards and not miss. And it's the same word for not sin. So there's a one framing of sin is a missing of a mark. Um, that's one way of speaking about sin. Another way of speaking about sin is um, transgression. Um, or Okay, so transgression, which is to go across, to, to transgress is to go beyond. The, the picture is now violating a boundary, um, something that's cordoned or marked off. And this is in reference to God's law, God's um, in rules. And so the notion would be of rule-breaking, um, and the iniquity is focusing primarily, especially when he talks about um, the Lord against whom does not count iniquity. Now we're dealing with, I think, a legal judgment. In fact, I think the reason Paul grabs Psalm 32, 1 and 2 is Paul really, in Romans, likes and develops the law court analogy. So impute, which is a, an accounting term, is also a legal term. It's, it's the verdict that's given. Somebody gives you a verdict, you pronounce, you're imputed in that sense, guilty or innocent. And so Paul, I think, grabs this psalm largely because of that word impute or account. He'll use impute in the Greek and the New Testament. And so here the iniquity is the notion of guilt or um, debt. So now the Lord is not imputing or accounting wrongdoing or, 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 or debt. He then uses the words in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, iniquity, confess my transgression. You forgave the iniquity of my sin, which I, I think, again, the notion is the guilt. So iniquity is focusing primarily at the notion of guilt or odiousness or... Because um, you can speak of the iniquity of sin, but he can also just speak of my iniquity. But off the top of my head, that's as far as I can go. Um, also, I think it's worth noting, I didn't mention this in the message, in verse 5, with the four parallels that show up, in the one that refers to God, he grabs from each of the first, okay, so in verses 1 and 2, you have four parallel statements, three of which refer to God's action, one to David. In verse 5, we have four parallel statements, three of which refer to David and one to God. The one that references God, you forgave the iniquity of my sin, grabs a word from each one of the three parallels in verse 1 and 2. So in verse 1, whose transgression is forgiven, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Whose sin is covered, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, you forgave the iniquity. So again, helping to reinforce, he's talking about the same thing. When he says in verse 5, you forgave the iniquity of my sin, He's verbally linking it to all three statements in verses 1 and 2. That those are all speaking of the same thing. These are not separate events. The Lord, um, whose transgression is forgiven, the Lord covering his sin, the Lord not counting his iniquity, is all, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. These are all different ways of speaking about it. There are other metaphors. Uh, the Old Testament also will use the metaphor of unfaithfulness. All of that language in Ezekiel of an unfaithful wife. Um, Israel is God's whoring wife. That's another metaphor of sin. There are the notions less law-breaking, more loyalty, a betrayal language. There's a betrayal in sin that takes place. And so when you're using the idolatry marriage metaphors, we're looking at primarily the notion of the, the rejection, betrayal of God in sin. 
So Paul uses mostly law court metaphor. I mean, these are all useful, good, right ways of speaking about sin, but the Bible can speak about sin in a number of metaphors. The law court, certainly one we're probably most used to, Romans is built around. And there's also the idolatry, betrayal, unfaithful concept that the marriage analogy plays out more often. But, yeah, I will get that for you before I leave. Any other questions on that? Yo, Renee, microphone, microphone. We have rules, Renee. And the lady sitting next to you is responsible for many of them. Yeah, Mom. Thank you (laughs) for making me follow the rules. Um, Maybe it's not on the same thing. Can I ask something else? Sure. Okay. Um, 2 Samuel 12, it talks about uh, when David's child died. Yeah. Uh, He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped, and then down in verse 23, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I have a note in my Bible that says, David worshiped God because he knows his child is with God. Oh, we're going to go there. I don't know. Okay. It's a note. No, no, no. Let me, let me, um, let me address that very quickly. I don't want to spend the rest of our morning talking about infant salvation. There are a number of texts that strongly suggest young infants die, go to heaven. This would be a chief one of them. Okay. Um, John MacArthur wrote the book Safe in the Arms of God right after 9-11. He's going to argue that. Uh-huh. I look at all those same passages, and I think, man, they really, really, really strongly suggest it. Personally, I don't think they're absolutely compelling. If you were to ask me, I'd say at the end of the day, I don't know. I think it incredibly likely that MacArthur's right. We're looking at the same evidence. He thinks it's compelling. The other reading would simply be David saying, he's dead, he can't return to the living, I will go in death. Or it could mean I'm going to go to heaven with him. It certainly could. And for those who believe the evidence is compelling, this is a big text, absolutely. I get all the implications. I'm not convinced it's compelling, but I'm not going to argue with someone about it. Like We're both seeing a bunch of pointers and you compare David's, the, another point is you compare David's grief over this child. Once the child's dead, he deals with it, he accepts it, he goes in, he worships God, he comforts his wife. Compare that with Absalom, clearly a rebellious unbeliever. And David is just so broken that right. Joab has to say, Good stop point. it. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> you know? So all of that evidence, both myself and, and, and the people who fully, well, all agree it's pointing the same way. Some look at the evidence and think the evidence, okay, that's, that's, compa- that's it's clear. I'm like it's 90% personally, but I, you, if you think it's clear, I'm not going to disagree with you. No, I... But no, this is, this is one of the Murray texts. Another one would be Job saying it would be better for him to be a miscarriage, um, which again, just could be hyperbole, or mm-hmm. it could be a theological truth. There's, there's a number of pieces like that that point towards that, but this is, this is a huge one. In the, in that yeah, debate. kind of my question was, David yeah. seemed so sure, and I didn't see something in the text, but he seemed so sure. Well, the question simply is, is David saying, I too will go right, to the dust, right. I too will join you yes. in death? There is a Hebrew sense of just the land okay. of the dead, Sheol, yes. right? Yes. We saw that even in Psalm 9 and 10, you know, you will not let, my, let me go down to Sheol, whereas the wicked go down to Sheol alive. And David's viewing one place for both him and the wicked. He's just talking about the sphere of death there. He could be just doing that here. Okay. Or he could be talking specifically about the place of comfort and paradise, where I will go with you there. He, he could be doing both. And um, I, I'm not in a position with any dogmatism okay. to say which Thank one you. is. No problem. Um, other questions or thoughts? I would really like to not spend the rest of the morning on infant salvation, if we can help it. Oh, that killed all this guy. Okay, well, we got nothing to talk about. Okay. Oh. In my writing. So I'm thinking it came from one of your sermons, but I could be wrong. It wasn't a footnote. I started. This. I didn't okay. mean to be a troublemaker. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. You, no, you're fine. I'm just saying that's such a. That's such a. Uh, uh, well, no, it's, it's two issues. It's, it, it's an issue close to home, right? I mean, Serena and I have lost a child. And um, many people have. So it's an issue that people care very deeply about. And it's also an issue that we have to largely argue obliquely. There's no, what, whatever the Bible teaches, there's no, ver- here's what happens. You've got to draw inferences. You've got to come at it sort of sideways. And so it makes it, it's an issue that the stakes are high. People really care because there's real world implications. And you've got to come at it somewhat obliquely. That All of that makes it, it's a good study. It's a useful study, but 
if we're going to do that, let's just set up and do that. And let me show up prepared to do that, which is all I'm saying why I don't want to do it right now. Next, next week. There you go. Okay, great. Uh, yes. Okay, other questions? Let me, let me go over. Well, first of all, any missing blanks, Lee? Okay. She got extra blanks. She made her own blanks. It was great. Uh, okay. Let me, I want to cover just, let me walk through this. I want to, I want to, I want, early in the sermon, I'm looking up, I'm like, oh man, I got tons of time. I should slow down. And then I'm like, oh dude, I got two minutes to go and I got to bolt. Um, the point I was trying to make about the same, well, let me cover the two main points. One, I thought it was really fascinating in this psalm that David links this deceit in his spirit with what's blocking him from sin. And we don't normally think of, blocking from forgiveness, we don't normally think in those terms. Does framing it, as we understand it specifically, David's deceit or his lack of truthfulness about his sin, does it make sense that that, an unwillingness to be honest about our sin, to call it what it is, to deal with it, to acknowledge it to God, that type of deception will compromise forgiveness? I mean... If I'm not willing to honestly deal with God about my sin, then we got, we got issues. The second is, do you guys get the distinction between initial forgiveness that happens at salvation and the ongoing sort of what I'll call relational restoration forgiveness that takes place? Because that can sometimes trip people up. I've met people who, you know, I thank God for forgiving my sins, but I don't ask him to forgive my sins because he's already forgiven them. And so let me, let me just take a minute to speak to that. We never repeat um, our justification, for lack of a better term. For, for there, for, so in the New Testament, John 3, whoever does not believe, the wrath of God abides over him. And so every one of us outside of Christ is, is guilty of cosmic treason before God. God's rightful wrath as a, as a king, as a ruler, abides over us. And at salvation, when we turn to Christ in faith... That wrath is removed, and it's removed for good. It never comes back. We are not, when we day by day ask for forgiveness, saying, we are not, I hope we're not saying, you should not say, I know that you're planning to send me to hell again, so please forgive me. We're not saying remove that wrath. The analogy I could use is this. Imagine a man is standing before a tribunal guilty of a crime, and he gets, he gets acquitted. He gets pronounced innocent. There's double jeopardy. There's no, there's no double jeopardy. There's no getting tried again. But imagine that man, he's a young man, gets adopted into the judge's family. That is the picture with us before God. And now imagine within that family, there are offenses, and I'm sorry, please forgive me. The, the man is not going to his father and saying, I know I'm sentenced to death, and please spare me from the gallows. He's saying, I broke our family rule. Please forgive me. That's the ongoing forgiveness and relational forgiveness we have. So you and I never run the risk, if we're truly saved, if we are regenerate, born again. God will never kick us out of his family, but our fellowship with God does wax and wane. Our fellowship with God is, is conditioned upon us walking. Now, it's, it's never, David's whole point in Psalm 32 is all you have to do is deal honestly, talk to God about your sin, and boom, you're good. You don't have to go do things. You don't have to say the rosary. You don't have to say Hail Mary. You don't have to go do good deeds. Just confess your sin to God, and you're good. Now, there may be consequences, as David well knows, but relationally, you're good. It's as simple as that. I mean, I love it. David says, I have sinned, Samuel, Nathan the prophet. I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to die. The Lord's taken away your sin. I mean, it's just that simple. But there may be consequences in the family. Just like in my family, if my children say to me, I'm sorry, please forgive me, immediately there's forgiveness and restoration. There may well be consequences, now, you don't get to, you know, play with that toy or whatever for a week or two. There may be, con- but any, any displeasure in our relationship, any conflict in our relationship is immediately resolved and restored. But absolutely, as First John, that's why I went to First John, shows our fellowship with God and our fellowship with one another is conditioned upon our ongoing confession of sin. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can move further away from God as you walk in darkness, and it's as simple as confessing and getting back into the light. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we're not getting saved over and over and over again. 
And we're not dealing with cosmic guilt and that type of forgiveness. We're not asking the judge to forgive us our legal debt. We're asking a father to restore our relationship and forgive us within a family. Does that that make sense? So I'll think of like legal forgiveness and family forgiveness, legal restoration and familial restoration. That's as belief. But the final point I was trying to make at the end of point of the first point is that the same faith and the same dealing with sin that deals with the legal forgiveness is identical to the faith and repentance and the confession that deals with the relational forgiveness. They're not of two different types. Um, or the faith that begins your Christian life is the faith that maintains your Christian life would be another way of trying to say that same point. They're not, there's not like faith A and then faith B. Right. Right, right. So that, that was sort of the big point that I was trying to labor on and where I spent all my time in ships this morning, sadly. Um, we just need to have a longer service then, you know, we can. You know, a bunch of people sit through a three hour Marvel movie. So, so, okay. <laughs> Touche. No, the gospel is not a one and done. Yeah. Amen, Renee. Amen. The gospel is not a one and done. Jerry Bridges. There we go. Excellent. Okay, any other questions on that or anything else from Psalm 32? Did my point about Paul citing in Romans click make sense? These are all things I just want to make sure I was being trying to be clear on. Um, that makes sense? Okay. Any, any, for, okay. I'm about to go off on a huge side tangent. So any other questions on Psalm 32? I got handouts and everything. Okay, go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it. When it says that there, it comes a time when it's too late, is that like when you're dead? No. Before you're dead? Just when you've, oh, you've, yeah. ter- you've said no so many times, your heart is stone and it's, let's you're go, let's not. Go, let's read Proverbs 1. Let's go read Proverbs okay. 1. Um, Now, I would say I'm an example of the exception. I trampled all over truth and grace for decades, knowing it, and God was patient, and instead of hardening to a point of no return, the Lord graciously brought me. So there are exceptions, but I think too often people who are playing around with the gospel believe they'll be the exception too. And the warning of Psalm 32 and the warning of Proverbs 1 is that's not usually what happens. What usually happens is you set, pick a course, you harden your heart to truth, it's harder to believe, and it's harder to change tomorrow than it is today, and it's harder the day after that, and it's harder the day after that. So Proverbs chapter 1, this is the opening, the first nine chapters of Proverbs set the course of the whole thing, and here's wisdom, and here's what normally happens, okay? Verse 20, wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the markets she raises her voice. At the head, the head of the noisy street she cries out, at the entrance of the city gates she speaks, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn to my reproof, behold, I'll pour out my spirit to you. I'll make my words known to you. So there's this free offer to anyone who will just like admit you need some help and I'll give you some wisdom. Then because I have called and refused to listen and have stretched out your hand and no one heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And would have none of my counsel, despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way, have the fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread or disaster. That is sadly, I believe, what normally happens. Um, There are exceptions. Praise God, there are exceptions. But so if someone's saying, I'm going to go my own way, and when things get really rough, then I'm going to cry out and repent. Like, maybe. Or maybe you'll just be destroyed. (laughs) 
You know what I mean? That's, that's, the, that's the point. It, and that's what David's saying is, seek the Lord till I may be found. Surely in a rush of great waters, you'll not reach him. Meaning if you're waiting until the judgments have come, if you're waiting until the, the consequence is coming, it may not work. Now again, the Lord knows we just would do well to heed the warning. And if you're banking on, I'm going to go my own way, and then at the last minute, you know, my deathbed sort of zoom in, maybe, but I wouldn't bank on it. That would not be my, that's not a good plan. <laughs> okay? Um, that's, that's, I think, the point David's getting at. Or like I was, like I said, I can, I can, ima- I can picture even at this moment having a conversation with someone. Um, they're, they're in my living room a number of years ago. And they were basically, we were talking, Serena and I were talking to them about um, a relationship idol, you know, and uh, the most frightening thing they said was, I know this is wrong, but I want it and I need to have it and God will just have to forgive me. No, no. And that's when, that's when I mentioned this morning, that's when I said, okay, let me tell you this is going to play out then. Either you are indeed God's child and he's going to discipline you and that's going to be painful. And oftentimes what he does is he smashes idols and he destroys them. Like, or you're going to go your way, be happy as a clam, which means you ultimately are not his kid because he doesn't discipline you, and then you'll suffer in hell. So either way, pain and discipline is awaiting you. There's no third outcome where you get this and everything's hunky-dory. So please, please just turn from it now. You know. Um, so that's... That's what I'm, what I'm getting at. Like there is, that's the warning David's giving. Like, don't be a dumb animal that takes a, a, a bit and a bridle and a whip, or even worse. And the most frightening thing for me is when somebody who, who, who claims to be a believer embraces sin and then not, they just seem happy and everything's fine. That's or in my life when I feel like God should be disciplining me and nothing's happening. That's the frightening part. That's where it's like, uh oh, <laughs> what's going on? Um, so anyway. Any thoughts or questions on that? Okay, we're going to take an aside now to, uh, let's go to First Peter. There's a phrase that occurs in Psalm 32, cover sin. This is the aside we're taking. Um, and I wanted to address it. We have 15 minutes. That should be enough to at least sort of deal with it. Um, it shows up in First Peter 4. Okay? So let's go to First Peter 4. And uh, let me... 4.8. Um, let's start in 4.7. 1 Peter 4.7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled, sober-minded, um, for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers multitude of sin. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as he's just given a gift and he goes on. And so there's a lot of dispute over what is meant by love covering sin. And I wrote a research paper in seminary. I've got a couple copies here, although it needs to be edited. Um, you read this. You, you gave me some edit. I, tr- I applied most of the recommendations, Elsie, you gave in editing it. But if anyone wants a copy, you can have it, but it's not... I wouldn't publish it or anything. It's still, it still needs a lot of work. But so the debate is what is meant by that phrase. And a common view, and the view that I was evaluating and disagreeing with, is that this means that there are sins that we, in love, do not address or deal with in the body. Love covers multitude of sins. In this view, it is said, I'll read a quote. I'll not name the author to protect the guilty. Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, Scripture gives us another principle for dealing with the vast majority of petty infractions. Overlook the offense. Forgive unilaterally, unconditionally. Grant pardon freely and unceremoniously. Another author states, It's only those sins that throw the covers off that must be dealt with by the Matthew 18 process. Those offenses that break fellowship or lead to irrespective conditions require forgiveness. And so the thought is that one of the things love does is decides you see sin somewhere, you see sin in someone's life, and then I'm just going to cover it. Yeah, I don't think that holds up. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up here is this, as far as I can tell, 
um, we can look at some of the occurrences of that phrase. It's the first occurrence of that phrase, that metaphor in Scripture, Psalm 32. I can't find anything earlier than Davidic authorship for, for that phrase showing up. So I think Psalm 32, 1 and 2 is its earliest occurrence. If not, it's one of the first occurrences. And clearly in Psalm 32, it's not God looking the other way. God sent Nathan to confront him. Covered is the consequence of David's confession, forgiveness, and restoration. Covered, then, doesn't mean not dealt with. It means fully dealt with, and now we can move on. It's no longer there, right? And so I just wanted to point out that in this first instance, covered does not mean, you know what, we're just not going to deal with it, we're going to cover it. No, God went to great lengths sending a prophet to David to rebuke him to uncover it so that it could be covered. And it's contrasted in Psalm 32 with David speaking of his own attempts to cover it, which God didn't bless. He says, uh, verse 5, I, will con- I, will- I did not cover my iniquity. Well, he was doing that for a long time. So, so one of the points I was planning on saying this morning, but we ran out of time, was you can try to cover your sin or God can cover your sin. You're not going to get both. You want God's covering. You want blood applied. You want it dealt with. Or you can try to cover your sin. But anyway, go to James. James. Well, actually, don't go to James yet. Hold on. I'll try to show you some of the the passages that um, are used to support this. Psalm 32. one. Go to Proverbs 10. Just do a quick tour through a couple of these passages. Um, Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. And again, I think what you think this proverb means is going to depend on what you import in with covering. So this is used as proof. See, you cover, love covers a multitude of sins. Well, here, first of all, it covers all offenses, not just some. But why couldn't it mean once a sin's dealt with, love doesn't bring it back up over and over again? It's been dealt with, you know? Like, the person dealt with it. And now it's covered, and so hatred keeps bringing things up again. Love lets it stay covered. In other words, what you think covered means already is going to dictate what you think this proverb is saying. If you already think covered means look the other way, don't deal with sin, well, this will reinforce that. But there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why it can't also mean, instead, take the definition of covered from, from Psalm 32 and plug that in, and it works just as well. If If... If I've committed some sin in my life and I've dealt with it and you know about it and you know I've dealt with it, if you love me, you're not going to keep throwing that in my face. We're going to move on, right? Um, next, Proverbs 17, 9. Um, which I think the exact same rationale works here. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but over repeats the matter, separates close friends. And again, I think the emphasis is on, are you going to keep talking about it, keep bringing it up, going to keep bringing it up, or are you going to let it stay covered? Um, but I think the decisive example is James 5. If you go to James 5, um, and this doesn't seem to be that controversial, so that's cool, so maybe, maybe I just picked the wrong topic to go off on. Um, here, this will this will raise some attention. The two authors I cited are Jay Adams and John MacArthur that I'm disagreeing with. So, it was writing this in my seminary was more controversial. Um, so, oh no, no, but there was no like you can't disagree with you know, but still, you know. Um, so James chapter five, we're looking at the very closing words of James. Um. We get there. Okay. Verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, is it not clear from this passage what covering means? Covering is not looking the other way. You went after the person, you brought them back, and only then is it covered. So... People will cite Peter, and Peter doesn't give any context. It's in a list of things we're to do. Be hospitable. Be fervent in the spirit. Cover sin. 
And I think it assumes that phrase has meaning that you have to import. What does he mean by that? And all these other passages, if you look at them, it becomes clear it's not looking the other way. Rather, I mean, James is emphatic. You bring, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering, like say Nathan did to David, will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That fits perfectly with the understanding of covering from Psalm 32, which is the consequence of confession and restoration. Now it's covered. Um, so anyway, that's, I thought that'd be a lot more debate on that. Oh, Elsa. Yes, microphone for Elsa. I was expecting this to be far more discussion on this. Oh, here we go. It's coming. So may I say the following then, if we look around us at the world, all this um, people being offended, people being offended, yeah. um, this, the whole social justice thing that's so unforgiving, um, the opposite of this is that, where everything needs to be brought to the light, everything needs to, they will take one thing that happened 35 years ago and destroy somebody's life. And isn't that what this means if if there is something like that, forgive the person and move on? If that's, I think yeah. that's the decisive issue. If it's been dealt with, then yeah, yeah. Stop, stop bringing it up. If you're questioning whether something's been dealt with, that's separate. In the whole social... Okay, good grief. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the five minutes to go, Elsa, well done. Um Part of the, I've been engaging with some friends of mine. I, I personally, as I've been looking into it, am not uh, in strongly persuaded at all to the merits of the argument for some of the social justice stuff. But I also recognize I've seen a small slice of the pie. I've got friends of mine in urban centers in L.A., and I want to listen to them. In fact, one of the things I said is, look, I live in Iowa. I don't have a massive diverse thing. So if you're seeing stuff that I'm not seeing, tell me, but make it clear. Let's, let's give, I mean, so like if there is injustice, if there's racism, if there's evil afoot, lay it out to the light so it can be clearly seen so we can all abhor it and we can all um, oppose it. You know what I mean? But let's, let's clearly define things. I've been trying, trying to do that. And so, yeah, if, if you've got clear sin that you have knowledge of and it hasn't been dealt with, by all means, using proper biblical channels, which is first going one-on-one to the person, according to Matthew 18, privately, go, go pursue it. Even if it's 20 years old, sure. You know, I, fine. No, there's no, that's fine. If it's been, de- but the problem becomes when it's not clear sin. The problem becomes when it has been dealt with. It's even trickier when it's generational sin. It's not my sin, it's my grandparents' sin. It's trickier still. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that means throw the whole thing out. I'm just saying, gets to be much messier and more difficult to work with. The, the, when it's much simpler when it's like, here is a sin. It's biblically defined as a sin. I have knowledge of it, and so I want to talk to you about it. Like That's really simple and straightforward. You know what I mean? Um, and it gets much, much more convoluted the further from that it gets when it's more like a people group has a sin. Okay, well, we'll name... You know. Well, I'll give you a challenge. Here's a challenge for you. Biblically, name the sin of racism. I'm not saying racism isn't a sin, but how would you biblically frame it? Preference? Who said that? Partiality? Preference? Yeah, it's probably a combination of hating your neighbor and partiality, and possibly even if you think your group is better, self-righteousness. It's probably some hybrid of those three things. So they're dealing with partiality, hating your neighbor, and I'd say it's some, some cocktail of those ingredients. My group's the good group, whether it's the white group or the American group or the whatever group or the Republican group or whatever. My group's the good group. The other group's the bad group. I'm showing preference and partiality, and I'm hating my neighbor. That's probably what we're dealing with, right? But even that becomes tricky because it's just assumed this is evil. And yet it gets trickier when Paul clearly has a love for his own people, a preference for Israel. Okay, is that racism? If you... And I think most people say, no, it's not. If you have a particular place in your heart for your own people, you're, you're, so Paul's like, I could wish myself a curse for the sake of my kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jews. Yeah. 
Right, right. And I'm, and I'm not trying to answer these questions. I'm just trying to say it gets stickier and trickier. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's really simple when you see a caricature of somebody who's like, I hate this people group. Like, yeah, that's wrong and it's wicked. Show me that and I'll condemn it too. But it's much trickier when it's, it's, it's just much harder. I, I've, I've, yeah, it's, and, and so I would caution, what can we all agree on? We are to abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is true. Wherever we see evil, every manifestation of evil, God's people ought to abhor it and hate it and grieve with those who experience it, weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn. Absolutely. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The real debate seems to be, is there a great evil currently being perpetrated or not? And on the one hand, we should be open to hearing it. On the other hand, we should remember biblical standards of evidence. Yes. And that's, that's the trick. And so I, I haven't closed my mind on the matter, but I'm talking to some friends who insist, no, this stuff's going on. Okay, show me the biblical, but using a biblical standard of evidence. And that becomes the trick because it's, it's much harder, I think, at least, at least the people I'm talking to, it's much harder to, to, when you start demanding biblical evidence as opposed to, well, doesn't, I mean, basically I'm, I'm being shown 15... Well, no, well, I'm being shown 10 or 15 things that look fishy. I'll grant that. Like, that's weird. These incarceration rates aren't equal. That's, some, that's fishy. Like, what's, but now let's do the research, and you've got to show how and why that's the case. Okay, that, and that's where the evidence and the research, and I'm not saying it can't be done, but in my conversations, it's just kind of assumed. See, this is, a, this is an unequal outcome, clearly. I'm like, no, there's 20 explanations. That could, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we, we need to be careful. We need to not throw the baby out in the bathwater. We need to be open to reason and hear these things, but we need to think critically. And where we see evil, we need to hate it. Absolutely. But we also need to not just jump the gun and come to rash judgments on the matter. The Bible, in, in Deuteronomy 19, you can read this is the passage, but we're at time. Deuteronomy 19 lays out diligent inquiry and you, and you hear both sides of a matter and you look into it and by all means let's oh dear you you asked me the other day do i ever feel nervous when you're about to speak this is one of those times mother this is one of those times i just want to make an observation that you're going from individual to corporate there's a microphone you, you gotta you gotta keep the rules Mom, the rules apply to you she's waving it She's waving at you instead. In your comments, you appear to be going from individual to corporate, you know, sin or guilt or, obs- or yes. uh, feeling. And you're, you sh- should be explaining the difference. Well, I'm just, I'm only explaining the need to both be open to hearing something. And but yet you, haven't having... even, you haven't even said you're doing that. Individual yes, sin... <laughs> Is quite different from corporate yes, or mother. historic. Yes, mother. And so the, the way to deal with it is different. Indeed. And on that note, we will break. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>